thank you so much for joining us for this Fertility Within Reach event, focusing on male factor infertility. I'm so excited to be here to be able to collaborate with Dr. Aaron Spitz. He's a very well-known and um, amazing fertility urologist here in the community of Orange County that I have had the pleasure of working with. He's also most famous for his The Penis Book, um, which is an excellent read for anyone out there who has not um, read it yet. Please go ahead and consider purchasing this lovely book. He's also been featured on the documentary The Game Changer and as well as on The Doctor's Show. So we're so excited to be able to focus here on a male's, um, male's a guy's guide, sorry, to male factor infertility. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kashani. Uh, Dr. Banda Kashani and I uh, have several patients in common and I uh, really have enjoyed uh, collaborating with you on their care and I appreciate you uh, introducing me to the uh, audience and hopefully uh, between my presentation and both of our uh, insights and answers to questions that may follow, we may be able to give some good information, perhaps even some hope to our viewers here and our participants here today. The uh, title uh, of our talk, A Guy's Guide to Male Infertility. And um, I want to emphasize that it takes two to tango. It's not just a woman thing about uh, some portion of up to half of all couples of, uh, who are struggling with infertility, there is a male factor component. There's an issue with the man in, in up to half of all couples, even though in a lot of cases, the woman is assumed to have the problem. And so guy infertility problems are often overlooked. Uh, in this presentation, we're gonna learn a little bit of an anatomy. We're gonna take a look at sperm tests and, and what they're all about different strategies to treating male infertility. Uh, sometimes it's improving the condition and sometimes it's working around it. We'll look at lifestyle considerations, ways that you can inherently improve or maintain good fertility, and look at specific causes and specific treatments for male factor infertility. So let's do an anatomy lesson. This is kind of a scientific looking picture and uh, it looks kind of confusing initially. Uh, but down there is the testicle, and that's where the sperm is made. And then that structure right above it, a lumpy structure, is the epididymis where the sperm is stored. And then the vas deferens propels the sperm up and around and behind the bladder. And then there's this other structure, the seminal vesicle, which dumps a bunch of fluid along with the sperm uh, into the prostate. Uh, and then in the prostate, more fluid is dumped in, and that all mixes together. And then that's the semen and it gets propelled out through the penis during ejaculation. If we zoom into the testicle, there are these tiny little tubes in the testicle where the sperm's actually made continuously like a factory conveyor belt. And then they are stored in a slightly larger diameter tube called the epididymis. And that's where they learn how to swim. That's where they get their, mo their movement. And then ultimately they are propelled up the vas deferens, which is a bigger tube that's surrounded by muscle that propels that sperm up. Now it takes sperm almost three months to form. So anything that you do from a lifestyle standpoint or medication standpoint is not gonna have an immediate effect on your sperm if it's affecting the very production of it. It's gonna take about two or three months to see the sperm that is affected by that. And it'll take a couple rounds of that to really change the numbers or the quality of the sperm in a semen test. Now let's look at a semen test. When you get your semen test and they show you the normals on the side, those aren't actually truly normal the way we think of a normal blood test, like a, a normal blood count uh, or a normal sodium level. These are what we consider adequate, okay? This is uh, two standard deviations below sort of what the average is, but it's still considered adequate to cause a pregnancy. And those normals are typically a volume of the semen at one and a half cc's, which is not very much. Uh, unlike you know, what might be depicted in pornographic films. A uh, concentration of 15 million sperm or higher. Uh, if, you if you multiply the concentration times the volume, that gives you the total count at 29 million. And then 40% of them moving or better. And strict morphology, meaning strict, how perfect is the shape of the sperm? Only 4% or higher is considered adequate. The vast majority of sperm are actually abnormal shape or abnormal tails. That's why there's, there's millions and millions of them because very few are actually perfect. Now, 
what does this mean in terms of normal? This is a very busy slide, but what you'll see here are these two bar graphs. The bar graph on the right, you see black bars and white bars. And underneath, you see different numbers of sperm concentration going from less than 10 million sperm per cc all the way up to greater than 100 million sperm per cc. And this was a study of over 700 couples. And the black bars are couples where they were able to have children. They were fertile. And you'll see that those black bars are present in men whose sperm count was less than 10 million sperm per cc and all the way up to greater than 100 million. But in each of those categories of numbers, there were men that had children, no problem. But there were also men who were unable to have children in all of those categories. So it's really interesting that the concentration of sperm doesn't draw a clear line where you can or you can't be fertile as a male, but you see the vast majority of both of fertile men of that black bar was in that 48 to 100 million. So greater than 48 million seemed to be pretty fertile after all. And if you look at motility, the percent of sperm that is moving in the, in the uh, bar graphs on the right, again, black bars are, these are guys that were fertile at very low motility. A few of them were at less than 16%, but the majority were fertile at over 52% motility. But you also see that there are infertile men at 52% motility and infertile men at 75% motility, those white bars. So the sperm test is a tricky one to work with. And when you distill this all down, we can say, well, subfertile, not likely to be normally fertile, is probably a sperm count less than 13 and a half million and a motility less than 32%. And really strongly fertile, is likely to be a sperm count of greater than 48 million and motility more than 63%. And indeterminate is in between, but it is tricky to work with these numbers as you can see. Now there's this other thing called morphology, Kruger strict morphology, which is how perfectly shaped are the sperm. And it's a strict criteria where they look at sperm under very high magnification and they look at the head shapes and they look at the mid piece, which is sort of like the, the, the crank for the tail. And then they look for the tail itself. And if 4% uh, are normal or better, then you're okay. If it's more than 14% are normal, that's excellent. And anywhere in between is, is okay. If you're less than 4%, that may reflect a problem. But even that is tricky because um, there are many guys I've seen over the years who have normal counts, normal movement, motility, and an abnormal strict morphology, and lo and behold, they get their wives pregnant before their appointment with me because the wait was maybe a couple months. But then there are others who are not able to cause a pregnancy and it may be related in fact to this morphology. It's a tricky parameter to work with, but that's the best uh, way to try to understand it. There's another kind of a sperm test that's not on a regular semen analysis. It's a specialized sperm test that is often ordered in addition called the DNA fragmentation test. What this slide shows is that that double helix DNA gets wound up into a more complex packaging, which then ultimately gets packaged in chromosomes, those, those X-shaped things that you can see in the nucleus of a cell. And what DNA fragmentation is, is a fragmentation in that packaging. So it doesn't get packaged up as properly. Now it's not about mutations and DNA fragmentation is not an indicator of the potential to have a birth defect, but it is an indicator of the function of the sperm. And if the packaging of the DNA is highly fragmented, then there is a lower likelihood that that sperm can cause a pregnancy with natural conception or with intrauterine insemination. But it doesn't seem to interfere in most cases with the ability of that sperm to work with in vitro fertility when the sperm is injected directly into the egg in a process called ICSI. Here's a way to try to understand how the DNA fragmentation test correlates with fertility. When the fragmentation is less than 20%, that's considered normal. And the odds ratio for pregnancy where one is normal is pretty normal in that range of fragmentation. But as the fragmentation increases from 20% to 30%, this sort of intermediate range, the likelihood of a pregnancy with uh, intrauterine insemination and therefore also with natural conception declines. And when it's over 30%, the likelihood of a pregnancy with intrauterine insemination or natural, con natural conception is rather low. So there are cases where a person can have normal sperm counts, 
normal motility, normal movement, and maybe even normal kruger strick morphology, but an abnormal DNA fragmentation, and they may actually have a hidden cause of infertility. But it is not an absolute test. None of these sperm tests are. And there can be cases where a person has an abnormal DNA fragmentation and still is able to cause a pregnancy naturally or with intrauterine insemination. So all of these sperm tests are tricky in that way. There is no absolutes unless there's no sperm or no sperm are moving. So the problems that we might have with sperm are too few sperm, poorly moving sperm, abnormally shaped sperm, increased DNA fragmentation, all of the above, some of the above, or just no sperm at all. So now let's talk about treatments. And this is sort of a general strategy. One strategy, which is the most obvious to most people, is let's treat the underlying condition. You know, let's get my sperm better. But that may or may not be possible. And so in cases where it's not possible or it's only possible to a degree, then we turn to assisted reproductive techniques such as intrauterine insemination and or in vitro fertility with or without intracytoplasmic sperm injection or ultimately even donor sperm intrauterine insemination. So intrauterine insemination is where sperm is deposited past the vagina into the cervix near where the egg will be entering. And this gets more of the moving sperm closer to the target because with just regular natural conception sex, some of the sperm doesn't make it through the cervix into the uterus. And you usually need 5 million moving sperm or more for this to have a chance of success. In vitro fertility is more complex, but is more powerful. And this is where eggs are actually removed from the ovary with an ultrasound and a fine needle after the woman has been given medications to stimulate egg production. And then sperm is obtained from ejaculation or some other technique. And then the sperm and egg are combined to allow the egg to fertilize and turn it into an embryo. And then the embryo is then deposited back into the woman's uterus uh, with a, a syringe and a cannula. Now, ICSI or intracytoplasmic sperm injection is where rather than just combining the sperm and the egg in a dish, a sperm is actually introduced directly into the egg with a very fine needle. It's injected directly into the egg, bypassing sort of the functions that a sperm has to do with getting to the egg, binding to it, and then, and then um, penetrating it on its own. So now let's look at some causes of male infertility and how we're gonna treat them. Uh, a very broad category of cause is lifestyle. Uh, certain lifestyles can impair your fertility and others can enhance your fertility. And then a very common cause of male infertility these days is testosterone or steroid use. Another common cause is too many veins around the testicle called varicocele. Vasectomy is a very obvious cause of male infertility, but in some cases, there's a desire to reverse it. Or blockages from some other reason. Or just very poor testicular function, which can be due to a variety of causes. Or a problem with ejaculation. So let's look at lifestyle. We'll cover diet and exercise, nutritional supplements, habits like alcohol and drugs, other health conditions, and timed intercourse and sexual function. With regards to diet, it has been shown that a diet that has less animal products and more plant-based foods is really better for sperm health and quality. So I recommend decreasing animal products from your diet, moving more towards the vegan end of the spectrum. But you wanna eat healthy. You can eat a very unhealthy diet that doesn't have animal products in it, such as donuts. Donuts don't have animal products, but I don't recommend a diet of donuts for sperm health. I recommend eating from the produce section primarily not from the butcher or dairy sections. And it turns out that nuts are in fact good for your nuts. A handful of walnuts a day or other mixed nuts has been shown to improve uh, sperm quality. Also try to minimize or eliminate processed foods. And you can recognize them easily because they're in wrappers, boxes, and cans. Exercise is also good for your general health and good for your fertility. Moderate and strenuous exercise is fine. And bicycle riding is okay, I get asked that a lot. Bicycle riding is more of a problem for erections in men that are susceptible based on their anatomy because the bike seat is pressing on the blood vessels and nerves to the penis that affect erections. And again, this is just in a small percentage of guys. But unless a guy is, say, overweight, wearing tight bike shorts for hours and hours, bicycle riding is not really much of a factor for sperm health. Um, 
Also, extreme endurance athletes will be shown to have actually lower testosterone and lower sperm counts, but that doesn't necessarily translate to any health impairment, uh, sexual impairment, or fertility impairment. It's just a finding on lab tests. Also, after that workout, don't get in the jacuzzi. Even one sitting in the jacuzzi can impair your sperm production and quality for up to three months. Warm showers are fine. The problem is that in a jacuzzi, there's nowhere to escape the heat. Our testicles contract and get closer to us or slack and fall away from us to regulate their temperature. They're supposed to be a couple degrees cooler than body temperature. And when you're in a shower, they can find a way to kind of bob and weave. But in a jacuzzi, there is nowhere to go. And so that's the problem. Also, there really hasn't been any proven benefit of icing those guys or the whole boxers versus brief thing is still not really proven. Now, nutritional supplements are a useful adjunct to fertility. Fertile one is a very popular one, but this is just one example. There's pro-fertile, there's male fertility supplement, there, there's a whole variety. And the key is to look at the ingredient list. And as long as the ingredient list is somewhat similar across the different brands, go with the one that's least expensive or the most accessible to you. These ingredients tend to work because they have antioxidant uh, properties. Uh, oxidants are sort of toxins, toxic-like chemicals, that may be in your bloodstream from diet, from obesity, from environmental toxins, and they degrade the various aspects of the sperm. They degrade the head, they degrade the tail, they degrade the DNA. And these antioxidants in these supplements help counteract and prevent that degradation and restore health to sperm. And they tend to have mild beneficial effects on sperm counts. These are not miracle cures for severe factor male fertility, but I think they're good to add to the mix. Uh, also, a very, very important source of nutritional uh, components and antioxidants is really diet. Diet is primary and nutritional supplements is supplementary. Let's look at alcohol and drugs. You don't have to um, go cold turkey uh, and, and stop all your enjoyment of alcohol. If you like to drink wine or beer, it's okay to have five alcoholic drinks or less per week, not per day, and don't save them all up for one day either. Um, but, you know, if you have a very significant male factor issue and your sperm count is very low or absent, then you really don't have much cushion. And I would suggest in that case to consider uh, abstaining from alcohol. Marijuana is also another tricky one. It has really not been shown to impair normal sperm counts when used moderately. But again, if you have low sperm counts or no sperm, you don't have much cushion. So I would, avoid, I would advise uh, abstinence. Narcotics, chronic pain medication use, not just short term after a surgery for a few days or so, but chronic narcotic use for people with chronic pain conditions will actually blunt the production of testosterone and sperm in the testicles. Likewise, so does heroin used because heroin is a narcotic. And then other drugs like cocaine and meth, these make your body sick, they impair your circulation and they impair your sperm production, so don't go there. There are other health conditions that can also cause deterioration in fertility, diabetes. Diabetes causes a whole slew of problems with your health and it also hurts your fertility. Diabetes damages nerves that trigger ejaculation and men with uncontrolled diabetes will find that they may lose their ability to ejaculate sperm. It also damages the circulation of the testicles and then can degrade the production of sperm itself. Also can degrade the blood vessels in the penis, making it hard to have an erection, hard to have sex, hard to cause a pregnancy. Obesity also decreases testosterone because testosterone gets converted to estrogen, the female hormone, in excess fat. Also, the fat cells release oxidants, those free radicals that degrade sperm and impair sperm production just by virtue of that excess fat. Uh, also, being obese increases your risk of getting diabetes. And I just described all the problems with diabetes as well as high blood pressure, the metabolic syndrome, overall deconditioning you and making your sperm production decrease. Then there are other health conditions that can come along and knock down your sperm. A high fever from a flu, for example, can knock out your sperm for several months, kind of like sitting in a hot tub, but it usually is recoverable. But a severe infection in the testicle itself may not be, um, may cause permanent damage and scarring and decreased production. Mumps is a very classic infection of the testicle that causes infertility, but with vaccinations, we don't see very much of that. Although there was a recent outbreak that affected adults, even here in Orange County, for which um, I actually did have to provide some care. Untreated STDs, gonorrhea, chlamydia, 
Uh, if you treat them quickly right away, they usually resolve and there's really not a lot of long lasting damage. But untreated STDs that go for a long period of time can cause scarring and damage to the testicle, to the tubes, and also in women can cause pelvic inflammatory disease and infertility damage to the eggs and the fallopian tubes as well. And then just regular old bacteria, guys can get infections of their testicle, of their epididymis, and it's not a sexual infection, it's due to an E. coli or some of the bacteria that was uh, in the urine or, or in the rectum. And if that goes untreated for too long, that can cause damage to the testicle and the tubes as well. Some medications interfere with sperm production. Patients who have uh, seizure disorder or ulcerative colitis may be on certain medications that interfere with their sperm production, but fortunately there are alternatives that they can be switched to that can restore sperm production. And there's select other medications as well, but fortunately not a whole lot out there that are impairing sperm production. And then environmental exposures. We know that guys who are exposed to certain uh, compounds in oil refineries may have some impact on sperm production. Um, certain uh, agricultural workers exposed to certain insecticides, typically not in the United States, typically outside of this country, can have negative effects on their fertility. And extreme heat, such as what uh, is encountered by firefighters or, or certain welders, can have some effects on sperm production because of that heat effect on the testicles. Um, now, as far as strategy for that natural conception, um, it's advisable to time intercourse with an ovulation predictor kit. And when that ovulation predictor kit says that ovulation is going to happen, go backwards a few days, even up to seven days, and try to have sex every single day. You don't have to go every other day or every third day. Go every single day. Yes, the sperm counts will decline as the days go by, but in fact, the quality actually increases, and the sperm survives several days inside the woman's uterus. So you actually will build up a welcoming party, if you will, for that egg. And during ovulation, that egg comes through just in a 24-hour period. And after that 24-hour period, it's gone. So continuing intercourse after ovulation is fine. It's fun, but it's not really going to do much. Now, sexual function. It is so common for guys to experience erectile dysfunction when they're facing infertility as a couple, even if there's no male factor in fertility. Um, the on-demand nature and just the stress of contending with infertility in general causes stress. And stress causes a release of adrenaline. And adrenaline causes the blood flow of the penis to decrease because it shunts the blood to the heart and lungs and brain to cope with stress. Your body can't tell the difference between stress from infertility and stress from a bear attacking you. Adrenaline is released whenever you have stress, whether it's psychological or, or true, real physical stress, and it always shunts blood away from your penis. So relaxation, mutual support, counseling can be helpful, but also there's no problem with taking medications that help increase blood flow to the penis. Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, Stender, or the generic Sildenafil, Tadalafil. All of these increase blood flow to the penis. They can overpower the adrenaline effect and they are safe and they don't have any negative effects on fertility. And I very commonly prescribe them for men and couples who I'm caring for. All right, let's look at some other causes. Let's look at what happens with the hormonal regulation of sperm production and why you shouldn't take testosterone to try to boost your fertility and why you should avoid testosterone if you're trying to have a child. So the hormonal regulation of the testicle uh, starts in the brain. This is the pituitary gland and it releases this hormone called FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, which directly stimulates the production of sperm, that three month process I showed you earlier. The pituitary also releases luteinizing hormone or LH, which stimulates these special cells in the testicles called Leydig cells, which then, once they're stimulated by the luteinizing hormone, release testosterone. And the testosterone stimulates sperm. But guess what? The amount of testosterone that the luteinizing hormone uh, stimulation causes is about 100 times higher inside the testicle than it is in the blood. All right, keep that in mind. And the sperm needs that 100 times higher level of testosterone to form. So what happens when you take testosterone, a shot, a gel, a cream, or other anabolic steroids, you put a certain level in the blood that is normal in the blood, but 100 times too low for the testicle. And the brain sees that normal level and it stops secreting the FSH and the LH because it figures, okay, we're good. We're good here. We don't need it. Uh, the blood levels are fine. And without that stimulation of FSH, the sperm isn't going to get the stimulation it needs to form. Without that secretion of LH, the Leydig cells aren't going to secrete that 100 times higher level testosterone that the sperm needs to form. And what happens is 
sperm production shuts down and also one's own testosterone production shuts down. Now, on the other hand, we can use medications to boost the system. So there's a pill called Clomid that makes your pituitary gland release even more FSH and even more LH, which jazzes up sperm production in some people and definitely boosts the testosterone production from the Leydig cells. And we can use this medicine Clomid to boost guys' fertility or to boost guys' testosterone when it's low, but the fertility is normal without shutting off their fertility. Another way to do this is with HCG injections. These act like the LH hormone and they directly stimulate the Leydig cells to produce more testosterone to stimulate sperm production. Let's look at another cause that's very common, which is too many veins around the testicles or varicoceles. So varicoceles are varicose veins, but instead of in your legs, they are in your scrotum. And the problem with varicose veins in the scrotum is that varicose veins are veins that don't flow efficiently. The blood goes two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back, and that sluggish circulation makes the testicles a little too warm. And remember, I said they need to be about a couple degrees cooler than body temperature. Well, this is kind of ruining that. And this can cause chronic progressive damage. It can lower sperm counts, lower the movement, lower the morphology, and increase DNA fragmentation. So the treatment uh, for varicoceles is to tie off all the abnormal veins, but leave the normal ones in place. So it's done through an incision in the groin, that's above the scrotum and above the penis, off to the side like where a hernia is, and the testicle and its blood supply are accessed, and then under a microscope we can see where the veins are, and we tie them off, but we make sure not to injure the artery or the vas deferens. And uh, when we look at this intervention, it turns out that it does improve fertility, and it can even improve fertility in very severe cases. So in a study of 540 patients who are categorized into those who would probably require ICSI, so less than one and a half million sperm in their uh, semen, who underwent varicocele surgery anyway, 20% of them, 20% of them were able to go on and have uh, conception naturally, but 80% of them definitely required IVF ICSI. And then in the group that had a little better sperm production under 5 million, 30% of them were able to go on to have a child naturally, but 70% still required IVF. And those who were thought to require intrauterine insemination, almost 40% of them were able to go on to have a child after the varicocele ligation. And those who were having trouble uh, and had more than 20 million sperm, but still had some impairment, about 60% of them were able to go on and have a child after varicocele ligation. So varicocele ligation is an important treatment. It doesn't fix everybody, but it can fix many. The surgery takes about two and a half hours. If you're doing both sides, about one and a half hours if you're doing one, it's under a general anesthesia. You're laid up for a couple of days of icing it and just sitting or laying around, uh, back to work after two days if it's office level and back to the gym or exercise or sex in two weeks. And as I mentioned, up to a 60% uh, success rate with pregnancy, but it can take a while. Uh, because it takes a couple, uh, three months for sperm to form and a couple rounds of that to see improvements, and because the process can be even more gradual than that as far as the improvement, we'll typically see improvements in sperm counts and pregnancies at about uh, nine months and it peaks at around maybe a year and it can even still go on improving up to about two years out. So it's a little bit of a wait and see and it does take some patience. It's not an immediate quick fix. Now let's look at another cause of infertility, very obvious cause, which is vasectomy. And for some guys, they would like to have their vasectomy reversed. So vasectomy is removing a piece of the vas deferens, which is the tube that transports the sperm up after it's been made. Um, the reversal of a vasectomy is a microsurgery where the two cut ends above and below that scar that forms there are then freshly recut and sutures are hand placed under a microscope to bring that back together. And this is what it looks like under a microscope and the passageway is actually only a third of a millimeter in diameter and the sutures are thinner than a human hair. But it is in fact a feasible operation and it can be quite successful. Success depends on how long it's been since the vasectomy. If you do it pretty soon within a couple, three years, the orange graph shows your chance of having a pregnancy. It's quite high, about 75%. And that sperm will be there uh, very high, close to 90%. And as the years go by, the pregnancy rates drop. So when you get down to about nine to 14 years, you're a little under 50%. When you get out to over 15 years, around 30%, there is no duration of time after which 
it cannot work. It's just that the success rates may be low, but not impossible. Um, another form of blockage is up at the level of the prostate where all the semen mixes together. You have uh, the fluid from the seminal vesicles, the, the sperm coming in from the vas deferens and the prostate fluid all converge in what's called the ejaculatory duct. And you can get a stone in there, you can get a cyst that blocks it, or you can get scarring down. And that will cause a blockage and you'll see a low volume of ejaculate and there'll be no sperm in there. Uh, so this is another cause for blockage. Yet another cause for blockage is an absence of the vas deferens. Some people are born without the vas deferens. They have the testicle, they have the seminal vesicle, but no vas deferens. Now this is just on one side, you're still gonna be fertile. And that can happen if a person's missing a kidney, they may also be missing their vas deferens. But where it really counts is when it's absent on both sides. And this is usually due to a genetic cause, which is called a cystic fibrosis gene mutation. This is a recessive gene, meaning if you have this condition, you had to get one of these genes from your mom and one of these genes from your dad. Now, in a severe form, it can cause cystic fibrosis, a very severe disease of the lungs and pancreas uh, that can make a person very sick their whole life. Uh, because of, of coughing and pancreatic dysfunction. But in a mild form, there's no cystic fibrosis. It's just no vas deferens present. But the person who has no vas deferens has these genes. And if their partner is a carrier of that gene, they could have a child that has cystic fibrosis. So it's important to screen the, uh, the partner of the guy who has this condition. And then the embryos themselves can be screened when in vitro fertility is done. And in vitro fertility is in fact required to, to treat this condition. The way we can treat all these different blockages, vasectomy, ejaculatory duct obstruction, absent vas deferens, is by extracting sperm. And there's different techniques for doing that. A common technique is a testicular sperm extraction. An incision is made in the scrotum, and then a small opening is made in the testicle, and then some tissue is taken out. And inside that tissue is a bunch of sperm because that's where the sperm is being made. And then that sperm can be divvied up into several batches and frozen and used for one or more in vitro fertility uh, cycles. Uh, another way to get sperm is to put a needle through the skin and, and aspirate it out. Um, this is less invasive, but the yield is much lower, often not enough for freezing. And sometimes you can hit a blood vessel in there and not know it and get a delayed bleed. Uh, you can also stick a needle into the epididymis. That's that tube where the sperm learn to swim and suck sperm out that way. It also has a relatively low yield. You may or may not have enough to freeze, but it is less invasive. Or you can open up uh, the skin and go right onto the epididymis and under direct vision, slurp up sperm. And in that case, you can get a lot higher yield, plenty for freezing in most cases. So all different techniques to get sperm when there's a blockage and then that sperm is used with in vitro fertility and it must be injected into the egg. It does require the ICSI process because that sperm doesn't have all the other enzymes and molecules that is in regular semen that comes from the prostate and comes from the seminal vesicles that enables it to actually go to an egg, bond to it and inject its DNA. So we have to do it for it. And that's where the IVF ICSI process comes into play with extracted sperm. So you cannot inseminate sperm. You cannot take that sperm and put it into a woman's uterus and see if she gets pregnant. It must be done with ICSI and IVF. Now let's move to a different category of problems where it's not a blockage, it's just very poor sperm production. There are known genetic causes for this. About 25% of guys who have no sperm in their semen, it's due to a genetic cause. It might be an abnormal number of chromosomes in each cell. A common one is called Klein filters, uh, where you have an, an extra, extra chromosome. 25% of guys have no sperm in their semen. It's due to a genetic cause. It might be an abnormal number of chromosomes in each cell. A common one is called Okay, I'm sorry, I was getting a little feedback there. Um, so, as I was saying, you could have an abnormal number of chromosomes, or it could be a problem specifically on the Y chromosome, which is the chromosome that has the coding on it for sperm specifically. In most of these cases, even though there may be no sperm in the semen, there may yet be some sperm produced at low levels in the testicle that could be found and used with in vitro fertility. Undescended testicles are corrected when a child is young, uh, but uh, they may not always result in improvement in sperm production. If a child just has one undescended testicle, they'll typically be fertile if it's corrected later in life, but if they have both testicles undescended, uh, 
there's a high risk they won't be. Uh, chemotherapy, radiation, other chemical exposures, or severe infections all can cause very spor poor sperm production. And then there are many cases where the patient doesn't fit into any one of these categories and it's sort of unknown. And that's because our science and our understanding is still evolving. Finding sperm uh, is then the way to treat this condition because in these cases of very spor poor production, you can't necessarily reverse it or improve it. So the task is to find sperm and use that with in vitro fertility. And sperm production can be really spotty. It can just be here and there in very small areas of the testicle, or it may be all throughout the testicle, just at very low levels. Uh, the technique we use to find sperm in these cases is called a microdissection, And that's where we go down to the testicle, cut it open, sort of split it. And then we look through all those tiny tubules, trying to find uh, tubules that are larger that may in fact have sperm, even though all the other tubules that are a lot uh, skinnier and empty won't. Uh, what that looks like in real time under an operating microscope, this is a 20x view, is you see this background where the tubes are really skinny, and then you have this area of plump tubes. And in those plump tubes, when you take them out, you'll find a bunch of sperm, and that sperm can be used for in vitro fertility. Another way to try to find sperm is with uh, multiple needle sticks where you inject and, uh, and aspirate out a little bit of tissue in numerous little places. And if you find sperm in a certain area, you can then go back there later and cut down onto that area and take the tissue from that area. This is a technique to find sperm, but it doesn't allow you to use it when you find it. With the microdissection, when you find it, you can also use it. And then uh, another category of male infertility is problems with ejaculation. Some guys have very low volume of ejaculate. Their count might be good and their motility might be good, but the volume is very low. And so sometimes we can get that volume up with a short course of Sudafed, the cold medication. Sudafed has an adrenaline-like effect and it can increase the force that the vas deferens and the prostate and seminal vesicles and the muscles are all contracting to increase the volume of ejaculate. Sometimes that works. But in many cases, it does not. So that's where intrauterine insemination can come into play because you can take that low volume of semen and put it directly in the uterus where it can get to the egg uh, more successfully and not be lost along the walls of the vagina or blocked by the cervix. In other cases, there's no sperm in that fluid or there's no fluid coming out. I mentioned earlier, diabetes can cause that problem. Now with diabetes, sometimes when you when the person is ejaculating, even though no fluid is coming out of the penis or very little is coming out, it is actually getting up to the urethra, but it's going backwards into the bladder. So you can check the urine right after you produce a semen specimen and there might be a bunch of sperm in there. And in some cases that sperm can be harvested and then used with in vitro fertility or possibly with insemination. Other men have spinal cord injury or other severe neurological issues. And in those cases, they won't necessarily be able to even propel the sperm up to the bladder where it might be found in the urine. And that can be treated with electroejaculation where a probe is put in the rectum near the nerves that contract the structures and that can help sperm get up to the urethra where it can be milked out and captured and used for insemination. Or you can do a sperm retrieval by going right into the testicle, right in the epididymis through the techniques that I previously described and use that sperm with in vitro fertility. So in conclusion, it does take two to tango. Um, and when we are looking at these different treatments, as I mentioned, some of them take six months, a year, two years, other them are, are immediate. Uh, and so we wanna take into consideration the woman's fertility status, her age to decide what the best strategy is. Does it fix the underlying cause and, and wait the time it may take? Or is it a workaround and get to the sperm and use that with a more rapid approach like in vitro fertility. And part of that has to do with the woman's underlying fertility. It also happens uh, to be important to consider just the goals of the couple. Sometimes genetic screening is desired for one or another reason, independent of male factor infertility. And in vitro fertility provides that technology to be able to screen embryos. Uh, and so a lot of what I do is uh, coordinating with the women's fertility specialists, such a specialist like um, uh, Dr. Banna. So with that, I would like to uh, end uh, my uh, presentation. Um, male infertility is 
involved in up to half a couples. It can be a complex process to treat it and understand it, but even in the most severe cases, we are able to uh, offer hope, uh, including with uh, partnership with our IVF specialists. And uh, let me go now uh, to uh, our panel uh, and to Dr. Kashani, and uh, she and I would be happy to have a little discussion and answer questions. But first, uh, Banna, do you have any questions or comments based on the presentation I just uh, provided? No, that, I mean, I'm always learning, so I appreciate that. I was learning a lot during that process. Um, I think that one of the things that's so simple to bring up, and I, I would love for you to just give a few more points on it, is how much diet. I love that your, your line was, you know, diet is primary, supplements are supplementary. And I think that people forget that. People are so easily, you know, swayed to buying a supplement over the counter and asking about what they can get, but really just kind of honing in a little bit more about how your emphasis on diet makes a difference. Yeah, so, you know, nutritional supplements are formulated based on scientific studies of the different ingredients that make them up. I mean, that's real obvious. And the problem with nutritional science is, is that it's so incomplete. We understand why certain ingredients are good for you, but only very superficially. And these ingredients are derived from plants. But the thing is, is that plants, and when by plants, I mean fruits, vegetables, grains, nuts, um, they have thousands and thousands of chemicals, uh, molecules, I should say, that haven't been characterized that are part of the reason they're good for us. And to just take supplements is to really just scratch the surface on the potential health benefits of eating the very plants that these supplements are derived from. Right. So if we rely on supplements, but not on the actual fruits and vegetables and nuts and grains themselves, we're really doing ourselves a disservice because we're getting such a small fraction of the beneficial molecules we could be getting. It's not just the number of molecules, it's the way in which they are complex, how they interact with each other. And we have no clue yet in our nutritional science how all that works. But it's safe to say when we look at people that eat more plants, eat more fruits and vegetables, their sperm is better. Is it those particular ingredients in Fertile One? Yes, but it's a whole lot more than that. We've got at least one very engaged person, Amy, who had noticed a couple of factors in the presentation that she wanted to follow up on. Uh, one of the things she asked was, what tests should be run for male factor if there's, an, I think she's saying, if there's an unknown cause, like poor count, motility, what would you be looking for, Dr. Spitz? So if the semen analysis is showing abnormalities like low count, low motility, I'm going to check a history, find out if there's anything in the history uh, from what I went through. I'm gonna do a physical exam. I'm gonna be looking for varicoceles because that's something that you feel on a physical exam. Noting the size of the testicles, are they normal or are they small? Because the size of the testicles is really dependent on sperm production. Small testicles are usually because of low sperm production, not low testosterone production. It takes very few cells to make the testosterone, but the sperm is really an indicator of the size and vice versa. Uh, I'm also going to be feeling the vas deferens for any sign of blockage or, or scarring. And I'm going to want to know what the hormone balance is. That slide I showed earlier about how hormones regulate sperm production, what for any hidden abnormalities there were some blood tests were actually tested, testosterone, FSH, and LH levels. We have a follow-up on Clomid. So again, do Clomid trials really show an average of about 10% increase? And trials show that about 20, maybe 25% of patients who have normal hormone levels, that means their, their brain hormone um, production is normal, when you put them on Clomid, have an increase in their sperm parameters. So the majority do not. However, all of them show an increase in testosterone levels. Now, and then sorry to tie on to that, but if a patient does have low, you know, uh, brain pituitary levels, does Clomid help also, is even more so than the 20-25%? Yes. Yeah, so for people who don't have normal levels but have low, num low levels, we'll see a, a higher response because that is the problem. When we give people with normal hormone levels Clomid to push them higher in the normal range, it's called empiric treatment. That wasn't the obvious problem because they weren't low, but we're just wondering if we push the system harder, maybe we can get more out of it. 
spermatic cyst versus the type of cyst mentioned in your presentation? Yeah, so. If I mispronounced that. Yeah, spermatoceles or spermatic cysts are very normal, common finding in men, and they typically do not interfere with fertility. The cysts typically do not cause a blockage, even though they're growing on the epididymis where the sperm are flowing and getting their motility. They tend to coexist peacefully and not cause blockage. However, if you operate on them, you very likely will cause a blockage from the scarring that happens from the surgical removal of them. So we leave cysts on the testicles alone. Now, cysts in the prostate that squeeze off the ejaculatory duct are an entirely different situation. They do cause a blockage. Uh, so that's the distinction. And you did touch on COVID-19 in the presentation, but a couple of, of different questions about virus transmission through sperm. Um, I know that you had shared a study with us earlier in the week. I don't know if you maybe want to touch on that at all and what the current thinking is. Yeah, so with regards to covid infection and sperm. A very limited study has been done in China on men who were infected with COVID, looking at their semen and looking at the sperm, and they did not detect COVID virus in the semen or on the sperm. And the reason they think that it is not showing up in the semen is because the COVID virus has to have a certain receptor on the cell that it invades. And it seems that testicular cells don't have that receptor. Now, this is a limited study, and the amount of virus in those men when they were studying them could have been at different levels, and perhaps at higher levels, it might have uh, broken through, if you will. But it is encouraging news right now that it does not appear that getting the COVID infection results in being able to pass it on like a sexually transmitted disease. I wanted to just tie, uh, talk a little bit about that. What are your thoughts though about people who do get COVID and you know are trying to conceive and they end up having a fever? Um, do you think that they should have a follow-up you know, semen analysis? Should they be assessed? Because oftentimes a significant fever I know can have pretty you know, significant effects on sperm count. So. Yeah, so, uh, Banna, I think that if you have a fever from COVID, you are at risk of having uh, an impairment of your sperm, but it should be temporary uh, once you recover. And uh, we don't know for sure that it's temporary in the COVID environment, but I think that given that it's not showing up in the sperm, there's no good reason to think that it wouldn't be temporary like any other fever from any other infection or flu. And again, that recovery period maybe uh, several months. Someone in normal health, um, a, a woman is asking, does my husband need to be seen by a doctor if he has enough sperm to work with? If a guy has low sperm counts, even though it may be plenty for the female fertility specialist to work with, say with in vitro fertility, um, I think it's a good idea for the man to get evaluated because there could be additional health problems at play. Dr. Kashani, what is your, what is your perspective on that? Because I'm, I'm sure that you see couples where you observe that the guy's sperm analysis is abnormal, but you could still do IVF on them. How do you counsel those couples? Yeah, so I think that there's always going to be a potential reason um, as to why a male is experiencing infertility. And so to basically ignore that and just assume that you can proceed with treatment, I just don't think it's appropriate. I, I really appreciate being able to, you know, refer patients to you. And I tell the, you know, male partners, you know, there has to be a physical examination involved, a detailed history, sometimes a laboratory evaluation, because God forbid, what if we even missed something as, you know, concerning as a testicular cancer, albeit it's so rare, but what if, you know? And so to basically ignore that evaluation, I think it, it's not warranted. Obviously, if it's a very mild case of just borderline motility, then, you know, we can reassess. But for significant or severe male factor, I think that um, it always is critical to have an evaluation. So, Yes, and I, I do appreciate how you do manage those patients with me. And one very common finding in men with low sperm counts is actually low testosterone, and they're not aware of it. 
And low testosterone has long-term consequences if left untreated. And those long-term consequences include a shorter lifespan, believe it or not. And there are ways to improve the testosterone production and the fertility simultaneously, such as varicocele ligation, or there are ways to boost the testosterone without compromising the sperm production, such as with Clomid. Uh, and so it is very uh, important for the guy's health and quality of life to be evaluated in case something as simple as that is going on or something as complicated as testicle cancer or even a, a tumor in the pituitary gland of the brain. Absolutely. Paternal age and whether recurrent miscarriage could be caused by it. So advanced paternal age is in a very different category than advanced maternal age because sperm production continues uh, up until death uh, if, a, if a man is otherwise without any causes for male infertility. But the quality of the sperm does decline, but it's not the rapid drop-off that you see with eggs and menopause. Now, there is a, likely a gradual degradation of the DNA fragmentation, and increased DNA fragmentation is associated with increased chance of miscarriage. And so I think that that is a mechanism where advanced paternal age could play a role in miscarriage. However, um, in many cases of miscarriage, when there are uh, products of the, of the conceptus that can be analyzed and compared with genetic evaluation of A, and these, these are rare cases, but it has been studied, say, at Stanford University, for example, the vast majority of the cases are traceable to genetic issues with the A. Mm -hmm. Now, mass paternal age can also increase the risk of other genetic conditions in the child, such as autism. And the percent increase is a large percent increase, but it's a large percent increase of a small number. So you take a number, which is very, very low at age 30, and you might double it by age uh, 60, but it's doubling a very, very low number. So it's not as if advanced maternal age has an absolute high risk of birth defects or problems overall. Uh, Dr. Kashani, what, what is your view on that? No, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I think that unfortunately, most miscarriages are linked to maternal age, which related to oocyte quality. Um, paternal age probably has some role more so for things like autism, which we see a little bit more prevalent um, or higher risk compared to younger men. But um, yeah. the, the benefit is that, you know, men do regenerate sperm regularly, and so that, that is helpful. And, right. From the Game Changers movie, Dr. Spitz, we have a few here, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but the general gist is, can a plant-based diet solve fertility issues for men, and what about women? So a plant-based diet can improve the, the general health of a, of a guy, and by doing so, can improve their fertility. Specific studies at Harvard University did show that men who ate a predominantly plant-based diet had better sperm quality. So I think that's a pretty simple, straightforward reply. Now, if a person has a severe male factor in fertility from a genetic cause, plant-based diet will not reverse that. Or if they've had chemotherapy for testicular cancer, or if they have... Um, a blockage, uh, uh, or some other cause that is unrelated to diet, diet will not be able to undo that. But if there is a condition where sperm is present, but at very, very low levels, everything and anything that can optimize the environment of that sperm production is encouraged. So nutritional supplements, plant-based diet, even in cases where the cause is genetic, is going to help increase the odds, even if it's slightly, of sperm being found because it, whatever cells are in the body are getting more nutrients and less toxins with a plant-based diet. The same is probably true for a woman, but as far as really dramatically altering the fertility expectations of a woman based on diet, Dr. Kashani, what are your thoughts on that? 
So there's actually a lot of new research coming out. The unfortunate thing is that there's no really good randomized control trial, which is the, stu the studies that we want to really evaluate diet. But there are definitely proponents of plant-based diet or Mediterranean diet. In the end, I think it comes down to the fact that, you know, reducing uh, animal products is, I think, beneficial for our health overall, and it does help female um, fertility and minimizing toxins or processed food exposures to things like that. There's a lot on, you know, BPAs and toxins that can also have an effect. So and I think diet definitely um, helps. I think a plant-based diet or Mediterranean diet is also good for people. We're about at time. Is there any any final wisdom that either you, Dr. Spitz, or you, Dr. Kashani, would like to share before I wrap things up here? I would like to say is that it's important for the guy to be evaluated very early on in the process so that time is not spent trying to optimize the female only to later on discover that there's a male factor problem. And I'm seeing that more and more that the guy is getting sent for evaluation early on. But it's also important for couples to realize that um, it's best to try to initiate a pregnancy as early as possible in the relationship if you're in sort of your mid or later 30s, or particularly if you're in your 40s. I do see couples who come in and they really want to kind of customize their life plans and uh, they want to wait until this, that, and the other is all stacked up. And um, when couples are towards that, that later edge of the 30s and 40s, um, the best time to start trying is yesterday. Yeah, no, it's absolutely right. And I think that one thing I'll emphasize is that it's so important for a semen analysis to be done with any infertility evaluation right on, off the bat because of the fact that it's this simple procedure, simple test to be done, um, and it gives us so much information. And then there's ways that, you know, you can investigate as there is an abnormality as to why and maybe potentially improve that without even requiring fertility treatment. Um, and I think that if anyone is seeing, you know, a fertility specialist and, you know, partner is diagnosed with male factor, I think that it's so important to find, a, you know, a specialist in male fertility, like a urologist, then can do that kind of appropriate physical exam and evaluation. Otherwise, you know, like you said, what if there was a blockage of vast deference and this whole time a couple spent six months trying to optimize diet? Well, that's not going to be helpful. So it's really about working in conjunction, finding the right specialist, being an advocate for yourself. If you want to, you know, seek certain specialty specialists, ask, ask questions and just kind of get answers. I think that that's really important. Definitely. And also, I just want to tell the men who may be facing infertility that it's important not to confuse fertility with masculinity. Uh, many men have low sperm production, but are otherwise completely normal sexually, hormonally, and a low sperm count is not in any way a reflection of some other deficit. Only in rare cases is it also a reflection of some other disease process. And in, in any of these cases, it's not your fault unless you're deliberately poisoning your body with bad habits and bad lifestyle choices. Great point. At Fertility Within Reach, um, you know, we've sponsored this webinar. We're a 501c3 national nonprofit organization. And, and our mission is to increase access to health benefits for fertility treatment so, and preservation as well. So if you have any questions about our work uh, and grant programs with Fertility Within Reach, it's fertilitywithinreach.org. If you would like to reach Dr. Spitz and Dr. Kashani, they have websites as well, erinspitz.com. And Dr. Kashani, what's the best website to reach you at? You can reach me directly through my Instagram handle at Dr. Vanna Kashani. I want to send my thanks to uh, Fertility Within Reach and to Dr. Kashani. Uh, for helping us get this information out here today. Likewise, thank you, Fertility Within Reach. And uh, as usual, Dr. Spitz, I was so informative and really enjoyed that presentation. Thank you. Thank you.